Hello and welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm your host here today, Jamie Hopkins, joined by my co-host Devin Eckbert and a friend of both of ours, Mr. Fao Powell. It's excited to have you on here. Uh, I know you've been on the show before, but we're, we're taking a different tone this time as uh, Devin and I have been doing this whole series just on retirement income planning. So really excited to have you back on. And I know we're down here in beautiful Nashville today. It was wonderful outside. So I appreciate you uh, stepping out of something that you're running to over at a conference and coming in here with us my pleasure jamie yeah well um i'm also glad you found the room right we had to go up like you know a couple a couple of flights and everything so it's it's nice uh we can show up in person now the question you've answered this before but we always talk about food and nashville is such a good food city but i'd love to hear from you kind of what's on your mind lately about food i know you answered this once before so has anything changed your mind your favorite food what's on your mind well I, so i wanted to expand a little bit so anything and uh, anything having to do with armenian food because mm-hmm. um half armenian so grape leaves dolma crema um, et cetera, steak tartare, mm-hmm. uh, would be something that I would relish. Uh, I'd say the other thing that would be uh, interesting, speaking to my Irish heritage, would be a good shepherd's pie. And then because I live in New England, anything having to do with lobster, and then also because I live on the North Shore of Boston, anything having to do with a roast beef sandwich, which doesn't quite compete with a steak and cheese from Philadelphia, but it's pretty good. Yeah. Have, have you made a lobster shepherd's pie yet? I have not. I think it's sometimes there are things that are better to buy than make. <laughs> I've tried making bagels and it wasn't, it was fun once and never again. Yeah. No, it's, uh, bagels seem tough, right? The, yeah, I haven't made bagels. I did make pasta on Saturday, like a carbonaro, and uh, like it was very good, but my I hand cut all my pasta still, and it's uh, that's a tedious process with three kids that are like, is dinner ready? And I'm still like, so my pasta was unevenly cut by hand <laughs> yeah so during COVID I did a couple things one was I tried to homebrew beer uh-huh. and that was an interesting experience uh, yeah. it actually came out quite good much to my surprise because I made a number of mistakes along the way and then my favorite dish that I made during COVID was paklava mm. which is also probably yeah. like making homemade pasta you know because you have to yeah, you have to butter each butter and every each layer, layer of yeah. yeah it was painstaking but delicious and well worth it that's awesome. I, I didn't know you were brewing your own beer during COVID. Oh, that my. explains a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> just saying. So, so one thing, if you're going to homebrew beer, is that it's at one point, it's a two-person job. And my wife, who hated the smell of the beer brewing, was like, I'm not helping you. That stinks. <laughs> and, uh, like, I need help because it has to go from this level down to this level. And I need someone to siphon it and blah, blah, blah. Anyway. So, so Bob, we've we've worked with you for a number of years. I've always admired the voice that you've created for yourself within the retirement income space, and um, you know some of the the content and information and and journalism that you've done is really impressive. But why did you get into this space? What was what was the driving force and an interest behind this topic for you? Yeah, so we have to go back into ancient history a little bit, right? So back in the ni- mid nineteen eighties, I was a stockbroker, and uh, a failed stockbroker. Um, Jamie, I think, I think you and I talked about mm-hmm. how I failed in this industry. <laughs> but what I did was I developed a love of the markets, and at the same time, I had a love of writing. So in nineteen eighty six, I went and got a master's degree in journalism. All my core credits were at the School of Journalism, and all my um, electives were at the School of Business. So I created, in essence, an economic journalist master's degree. And then from there, I went into business journalism, uh, did that broad business journalism for a while, gravitated toward personal finance journalism, and I've been doing that ever since. And I think part of my the rationale for going into this was, uh, one, I had the expertise, and also uh, a passion to uh, do what I would call service journalism to help other people in ways that they needed help where, you know, we all grew up in places where we probably didn't have financial education when we went to school. And uh, it, it became important for me to sort of help other people learn about money. So that was sort of how I got into personal finance journalism. And then how I got into retirement journalism in particular goes back to maybe 2003 when Market Watch asked me to launch Retirement Weekly. And um, we launched Retirement Weekly. And part of the premise was I had been listening to Ken Dykewall for many years from AgeWave talk about this growing mass of people marching toward retirement, all of whom knew nothing about what they were about to enter. Mm-hmm. And I thought, we have an opportunity here to educate now retirement savers and uh, soon-to-be retirees about everything and anything having to do with 
retirement. So, does it surprise you at all that people consider you to be the retirement guy? You know, in the in the, in the column and and other things like that, the, re, the retirement manager. It's journal, yeah. I mean, I, I you know, people. Some long time ago, someone said, you know, we should call you Mister Retirement, right? And that that moniker has stayed yeah. with me for a long time. <laughs> I I you know, I'm sort of embarrassed by it because there are so many good people writing about retirement today. You've had Mary Beth Franklin on your show, um, you know, Ed Slot. I mean, there are a lot of people who could claim the title Mister Retirement. So I, 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 yes, I, I'm glad to be known that I'm a yeah. subject matter expert in the topic, but I don't, I'm not the only one. Yeah. I think Mary Beth might claim like the queen of social security or something too, right? Yeah. That's probably hers. Yeah. We can all, I guess, have a lane if we want. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's fine. But the thing about it is it's so interesting that once I had a, a job interview with the Boston Globe and they're like, what, you know, why do we always get beat by, you know, you? And I said, well, you know, you have to, you have to be willing to eat, breathe and sleep this topic. Yeah. Right. You have to go to bed reading a center for retirement research at Boston college, you know, research report. Mm -hmm. And, uh, instead of going to Martha's vineyard on the weekend, right. You, you've got to love this topic. And, and I do, I find it so fascinating because each and every day we'll talk more about this, right. New products, new research, new regulations, mm -hmm. just new things to talk about. It's not a, a dry subject at all. Yeah. I love that. I agree. Yeah, it's uh the, even coming down in the elevator today. There was one of the you know kind of managers of the hotel, and he's like, "You're gonna have a good day," and I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna have a great day because uh, I'm gonna be talking about something I love today, like all day." And yeah, he's like, oh, that's great. Like, what do you do? Retirement? He's like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, he, he he wasn't ready to run the shows. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's interesting. And, you know, the other thing is like for me, you know, uh, it, part of what I do is also modeling behavior for my children. Right now, mm -hmm. I know this is a, a sort of a off topic a little bit, but this notion of doing what you love, right? And not having to sort of say, I'm going to work and I hate what I do. Like my kids never look at me and say, you hate what you do, right? No, I'm like, they, dad, you love what you do, right? And I do. Yeah. And, and I have to give you one more example. So we, we, you, I think there's a question that you're going to maybe ask later, but I, maybe I'll jump ahead. You can just go it. right into it then. Okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> So, so, as a reporter, you're just taking the questions and answering well, you know, yourself this, now. <laughs> Jamie, 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 this is an odd place for me to be, right? Because usually I'm the one asking yeah. questions, not on the receiving end. Uh, but you know what? So why do I do what I do? There's two stories. One is the starfish story, which I, maybe you and I have talked about in the past, Devin. Which is uh, the story goes like this. Uh, uh, there's a huge storm, thousands upon thousands of starfish get washed up on the shore. And there's a little boy picking up one starfish at a time, throwing it back into the ocean. And, uh, and as the story goes, it's a rabbi, a priest or a minister comes up to the boy and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm saving the starfish. And he says, you can't possibly save them all. And the little boy picks up a starfish and throws it back in the water and says, I just saved that one. And so that's how, how I view what I'm doing is I'm sort of on a mission to help one person at a time become better at saving for and maybe living in retirement. And, and I have proof positive of my starfish. So I have to tell you this quick story. I have an intern from Northeastern University. Uh, Sadie is just turned 19. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and what I did was I said, part of your assignment for working for me at Retirement Daily is I'm going to give you a small bonus, and then I want you to go investigate how to open up an IRA. It could be a traditional, it could be a Roth. And then I want you to write about your story of opening up this IRA, the research that you did, who you chose, what investment you did. And Sadie just turned in their story last Friday, and it's remarkable. So the lead to the story is... I'm 19 years old, and the only thing I ever invested in were gummy bears. <laughs> and, and now I'm an investor, and I have a Roth account, and I own whatever it was, yeah. some index fund. That's awesome. And, I love that. And, that. Right? and Sadie will become you know, a lifelong investor. Yeah. So yeah, you've uh, you've saved one starfish. One starfish. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been more than that, but you know, you've got one recent starfish you put back into the ocean. Yeah. It's, uh, so you brought up in there this conversation about, you know, um, we'll go to this one next, this challenge between saving. And we had all these people saving and, you know, depending on how you want to view it, but through Social Security, through pensions, through 401ks, IRAs. But the income space was very different. Right. And we had this, you know, group that was nearing it and we didn't have a lot on it. Mm -hmm. So you've written recently too how much more challenging the distribution side is going to be than the saving side. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that picture. Sure. So for that column, I interviewed Professor Shu from Cornell University, behavioral finance expert, consumer expert, studied with Thaler, the mm -hmm. did her dissertation with Thaler. And her thought was that on the saving side, everyone's interests are aligned, right? Mm -hmm. The government wants you to save, your employer wants you to save, you want to save, no one's telling you not to save. So everyone's nudging you, right, Thaler, yeah. et cetera. But when you get to sort of leaving your employer, everyone's interests are now misaligned, mm -hmm. right? And, and there's no 
uh, economic interest in having your employer doesn't care what you do with your money after you leave. The government, you know, yeah, we'll get our taxes, whatever. Uh, and then what you get depends on who you go to. So maybe if you go to an insurance silo, you might end up with this solution. If you go to a broker dealer silo, you might get this solution. If you go to a RIA silo, you may get this solution. And so there's no best practices. And the person is sort of left on their own to figure out, well, how do I create a paycheck in retirement? Everyone was there to help me save yeah. for this time. And now and no one is here to save say what I should do or what they tell me I should do is different depending on who I talk to. Yeah. And uh, I've thought about it before, too. We talked with Thaler about the, the nudges and that we've built all these in on the accumulation side. But they, you know, there's a couple, I would say, on the decumulation side, but not nearly as many, right? I mean, you could argue RMDs are one, some things like that. But again, you know, it's not quite the same, right? Because it doesn't align with people's retirement, right? Like RMDs start now at 72. You might have a decade before that nudge actually right. shows up to help you or guide you in your retirement. Retirement. Yeah. Well, um, the, and the other interesting thing is, right, you, you know, on the, you know, Nobel Prize winners have said this retirement puzzle is the most difficult thing to solve, right? We've yeah. we've had people say, well, if you knew your date of death, this would all be easy. But since I don't know how long my money has to last, figuring out, should I use the RMD method? Should I use a 4% rule? There's a lot of uncertainty around what your um, spending pattern should be in retirement. So you've, uh, you know, kind of going back to that side too, how do you see this space having changed in the last, I guess, 20 plus years since you started that first column, right? Uh, you know, how have you seen it evolve, I guess? Yeah, I think I, it's it's evolved from something that was maybe quite elementary. We'll start with the Bengen 4% rule, right, which everyone sort of hung their hat on for many, many years. But over time, we've seen much more academic research come out. Some of it, you know, contradictory, mind you, but, but some of it much more based in what I would call uh, real academic science versus junk science. That's the term that Z. Bodhi would use. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it has given us a chance to sort of elevate the amount of... Um, of uh, education around this. Now, it's also created some confusion uh, here at the conference that that we're at today. I'll be moderating a panel discussion where, in essence, we'll be presenting two, what I believe are two conflicting conclusions about spending in retirement, whether you should have a high equity exposure or a low equity exposure, whether you should be de-risking when you roll over your IRA or not. And so there's still competing um, research out there, but nonetheless, it's it's the discussion is that much higher, I think. And so from my perspective, it went from saying, oh, just take 4% out to, well, let's think about whether liability-driven investing is something or or whether, in fact, I should use the RMD approach because it, it, it forces me to spend less than I should early in retirement and end up maybe with a larger uh, pool of money that I don't need when I'm in my no-go years. Hmm. Uh, you, when you talked about the industry being so like fragmented and segmented and over there, uh, what, what kind of grade would you give the advisors in this space? in sort of distilling all of this information for their clients and communicating it to their clients in a way that they can understand. I mean, you used a term like, uh, pay where, where's my paycheck going to come from? Yeah. A paycheck replacement type mm -hmm. theory. Uh, what what uh, role is our advisors playing today and, and how well are they doing that today? Well, I, I think I could start by saying they could do a much better job, right? I think there's uh, a lot of what they do is based on what they had done before. So if you're going to an advisor who uh, was... Uh, and a, a, a proponent of the 4% rule, they probably won't look at other tools. Um, and if you're talking to another yeah. person, they might not look at other tools that could be available. And I think that's the big tragedy, right? I, I always say, if you had to build this industry from scratch, it would look nothing like it does today. And one of the things um, about that notion is if you would never go to a general a contractor, for instance, right, or a dentist who didn't use all the tools available well, to them to do their job. But that's, in essence, what happens today. We are sometimes going to advisors who only, you know, maybe their toolbox has a hammer and a screwdriver, but what they really need is a buzzsaw and, and a jackhammer. I don't, you know, do you think that comes from a lack of education or maybe a lack of incentive? I think um, a little of both, right? It, it, so I, I remember talking to an advisor once who was arguing with, with Svee Bodhi about whether they... <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry, I just have to laugh because I think everyone that talks to Z Bodhi, I think, gets in some type of argument. But right. it's uh, it's always like a very educational argument. You walk away kind of thinking, okay, maybe the maybe this crazy guy actually has a point here. Well, again, right? It's based on scientific research, and and him saying that stocks are you know never not risky in the long term, and uh, okay. and of course, advisors' experiences to the contrary. I remember talking to advice; they were head to head arguing, right? And the advisor with a great amount of hubris said, my clients have never experienced what you're talking about, right? So anecdotally, you know, Zvi is in the wrong, but maybe there's, you know, at some point in the future, stocks, it'll prove him right, right? But we may not be alive to see that happen. Or maybe we're watching it happen now that stocks never, right, get, do get risky in the long term. And, and so, you know, in that case, a person that advises experience, you know, suggests that he was in the right, right? And, and, uh, and there was no incentive to become educated beyond what he experienced. Yeah, it's. Uh, I remember having this conversation with Wade before too, and what Wade makes a very good point on all the things about risk is it just depends on how you're defining risk, right? Like, you know, he's like, you know, you can make an argument on both sides with stocks long run that they're either less risky or more risky over time, right? And it just depends on which risk factor you're looking at. Yeah, and that tends to be true with like a lot of the retirement pieces, right? Um, the one that's always stuck to me is longevity. And I've tried to get better at this. I'm still not perfect, but you know, everyone calls it longevity risk. And at one point I realized I was like, it's not a risk. Like there's no risk with longevity. It's a risk exacerbator, but like longevity is a great thing. Like it's not a risk. Like you know, you're risking living a long time. Like that's a great thing, right? Yeah. That's a great outcome. That would be like, it's like the risk of winning the lottery without paying for a ticket. Like, <laughs> no, that's not a risk. It's fantastic. It's a reward, but it does exacerbate other risks. Right. Um, so in that context, right, we have to make a lot of decisions that are somewhat permanent. In, as it relates to retirement. I think that's one of the challenges, right? Like, I mean, retiring and withdrawing money from your account, it's a semi-permanent decision, right? When you claim Social Security, semi-permanent, right? There's some things there, but most of these are one-time decisions. So I want to start talking about that, this spectrum of kind of early retirement through, and, and what are some of the decisions that you see that people could do better on when they're deciding when to retire. Yeah, so I think a couple of things. Obviously, the Social Security claiming decision is a is a big one because while it's not irrevocable, right? You can certainly in the first year of claiming redo it, and certainly after FRI, you can do a voluntary suspension. So there are some uh, uh, tactics that you could use to reverse your decision, but by and large, it's an irrevocable decision. Let's call it that. And a lot of times, people make the decision based on a couple things, right? Behavioral, they say, "Oh, it's my money. I want it now." Before the government runs out of money and they go bankrupt, and I'll get eighty cents on the dollar, so I'm taking it now. Uh, in some cases, they're they're saying, and in some cases, they're rightly so. They're saying, "I'm I'm ill. My longevity." right? My life expenses is low. I, I'm going to take the money. Uh, in some cases, they're making the decision based on the break-even point, which would be a terrible way to make a claiming decision. And then in other cases, they're disregarding the fact that maybe if they're the higher earner, earner spouse, they're not making a household decision. They're saying it's, it's about my benefit, but not necessarily thinking about the survivor's benefit. So I'd say first and foremost, think long and hard about the Social Security claiming decision. And though we no longer have those tactics that we did prior mm -hmm. to the Bipartisan Budget Act of um, 15, 15, 16, 16? Yeah. 16, yeah, whatever it was, um, uh, you know, you still have claiming decisions to make that, you know, have effects downstream. Right. And the same is true if you're lucky enough to have a defined benefit pension plan. You know, if you're making a single life uh, uh, pension option payout, uh, maybe you ought to rethink that in light of everything else that, you know, again, downstream surviving spouse, et cetera. Um, I'd say, you know, this notion of um, a lot of people don't want to spend down their IRA in order to bridge the mm -hmm. possibility of extending Social Security to age 70 or so. So I think more education has to be done around this possibility of, you know, we're doing two things. If we're going to take distributions from your IRA before 72 or whatever it is after Secure 2.0, <laughs> um, that maybe what you should be thinking about is two things. One is increasing the best um, income stream that you could ever have, right? Inflation adjusted for the rest of your life. And then also reducing the p potential for RMDs later afterwards, and which also has downstream effects in terms of maybe it's increasing your income uh, related monthly adjustment amount, right? Later on for part B. So there's a lot of decisions around, um, I think, Social Security uh, and your personal assets. And then, of course, there's some nine financial things that need to be considered, which is, you know, are you retiring? from something or to something. And, you know, so often people retire and then go back to work um, doing the same job that they did before because they didn't know what they were going to do in retirement. So I suggest that one mistake is uh, to avoid would be think two years before you're going to retire about how you're going to spend time in retirement. Yeah, 
that's uh, the kind of like figuring out what you're going to do next, I think, is a really important part of this. And often one that we probably, if you go back to the advisor world, I don't think we do a great job on still, right? Because we focus so much on the financial part. So they'll run a model for you and say, hey, here's what you can spend. But they don't necessarily figure out like, well, you know, you told me you like golf. And this is the, the obviously the, the overused example. But, you know, do you really like golf seven days a week, right? Or do you like golf one day a week like you have been doing? And what are you going to do then for the other six days a week? And that becomes a really big challenge. And I'd love to hear both of your opinions on, you know, how would we better incorporate phased retirement into the U.S. system? Because we don't really have that as a, you know, I think it's something like 10 to 12 percent of companies have a formal phased retirement policy. Um, almost nobody does. Um, however, you could probably argue it might be the single biggest additive thing you could add to fixing the retirement income puzzle is having people phase in over a three to five year time period, right, would move most portfolios that are right on the edge to positive, yeah. right? But we just, we don't do it. Um, so I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on that one. Well, this is actually something we maybe even work together on a little bit is, you know, we look at education, right? So I've been focused a little bit on advisor education. I, I think, you know, advisors, like you said, traditionally haven't really looked beyond the financial models and, you know, what, what all of this is and looks like. And they're more focused on optimizing wealth, per se, and not really optimizing people's lives with their wealth. And sometimes they don't feel like they have even permission to talk about that outside of the financial <laughs> services. So I think a lot of the educational programs that I've seen, the RMA program, Bob, that you've been involved in, the RICP program, Jamie, that you've been involved in so much, you know, I think that's helping the advisor space. And then I've always felt like the educational programs for clients have been just very lacking. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's very hard to do. It's very scale, uh, very hard to scale. And there's not really a central voice to yeah. deliver that education to the clients. But I, I feel like education kind of has to be a part of the solution. I think Bob. so, too. And, and I think, you know, sometimes advisors are averse to talking about this because they haven't been trained to talk about this. So and I think, you know, years ago we had a speaker at, at the conference, Larry Jacobson, if I recall, yeah, I Jacobson, who talked right. about helping people find their purpose in retirement. And I think if we had more of that, of that kind of education, um, a company just published a guide to retirement and they talked about um, find, helping people find their purpose mm -hmm. um, and helping people identify what um, a social network, um, mm -hmm. which is a really important retirement in addition to a purpose, and creating you know community. And uh, you know between those three things, that could help people in drive satisfaction above and beyond the money aspect. And one more thing about um, phased retirement, you know, the, our country isn't set up for phased retirement at all. Anna Rappaport from the mm -hmm. Social Society of Actuaries has, has written quite extensively about this, and we're just not there yet. I mean, some companies are um, in the aerospace technology world. They can say you can tail off. But other people are creating their own phased retirement. I have a dear friend. He left the pharmaceutical industry and became a consultant now to pharmaceutical industries that are trying to bring drugs to market. And he's set his own hours. He's working 20 hours a week and keeping track of the time and his projects and whatnot. And I think he's going to move from 40 to 50 hours a week to 20 to maybe 10 over time. And he's created this lifestyle of, I still have earned income. It's taken pressure off my portfolio. And, um, and I still get to do all this travel. They're at the Hoover Dam right now yeah. as we speak. So. Yeah, I actually remember interviewing uh, Anna Rappaport about that topic, and I, I did have I did have a test question. I don't know if it still exists because that's about a decade ago now. But we wrote a test question on that one from that interview with her, so it existed at some point. So yeah, that... somebody might still be taking that test with that <laughs> question. <laughs> you know, they they seem to survive a long period of time in the advisor education world. Yeah. You know, Jamie, can I go back to the longevity question? Because yeah. you raised an interesting point, which is, you know, longevity has been described as, uh, yes, a long life, but also outliving your assets. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things that, you know, happens is you really don't, it's not that you outlive your assets, you probably have your assets still, but you're, what you've suffered is a, a decline in standard of living, right? You've lost that. Yeah. And and I think that's the thing that people uh, need to factor in. when I When I think about retirement failure, it's that the possibility or the notion that I can't have the desired standard of living for as long as I want. And I think for me, like when I think about all these um, tools that we've given advisors, Monte Carlo, for instance, or whatever, and we tell people, oh, you have a 90% chance of, of your money lasting till age 95 or whatever it might be, is that we sometimes forget, others have written about this, right? Well, well what's the 10%? When's the, mm -hmm. when's the failure going to happen? What's the magnitude of that failure? Is it early in retirement? Is it late in retirement? Um, and I think, you know, for many people, just relying on Monte Carlo as the benchmark for determining, you know, whether you'll have enough money to fund your desired standard of living over time, it may be inadequate. 
Well, I think I think it's interesting that when you ask people what they're worried about retirement, it that it is some form of longevity risk, even though, like you pointed out, it's not really a risk. People want to live longer, but yeah. they understand the implications of that. And and even if they can't articulate it, they, you know, you ask somebody, "What are you re- worried in retirement?" Um, well, I'm running. I, I just want to be okay. Mm-hmm. And, and what that further means is, I don't want to run out of money, or I don't want to eat cat food in retirement. It's some version or variation of that, and then it's kind of the advisor's job to figure out, okay, well, what exactly does that mean? What exactly are you worried about? And, you know, and then we can kind of come up with some solutions from there. The the other interesting thing from my perspective is is this notion of spending in retirement. We Mm -hmm. talked about it a second ago. But if you, I've been looking at a lot of research. Rand just came out with some interesting research about um, uh, real spending as opposed to nominal spending. And, you know, what they showed on an inflation-adjusted basis is that spending declines. And and, and others have shown that. Blanchett has shown that, et cetera. But more often than not, people are looking at it on a nominal basis. But most times when people are planning, advisors are planning for someone's spending horizon, they're maybe inflating it at a constant inflation rate. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is those numbers should be probably adjusted for the three phases of retirement and maybe it's a one percent real for the first third of retirement maybe it's a two percent negative in the second third and maybe some you know x number on the upside you know to factor in healthcare expenses late in life and so i think there needs to be some adjustments to modeling too to sell, tell people that their portfolio does survive and that maybe they can spend more money early in retirement and that's you know a big problem today is really people are just spending to their income that's coming in whether it's social security and rmds and maybe denying themselves the possibility of a better standard of living in the first third of retirement yeah, you you brought up this one, and I I think I saw the, the fidelity study came out that day three hundred and twenty five or forty five thousand dollars for the average couple they need in today's dollars right to meet their healthcare expenditures. And obviously, there's a lot of assumptions that go into that. Um, but I always I'm always interested by those studies because they almost don't tell the actual story because like that's a lot of money. But the real risk is that like top 10% group, right? Where all of a sudden it's a million to $2 million that you need today to meet those. So how do you think advisors should address some of those uh, almost tail risks? Like the long, like the people who are going to live from 95 to 105, the long-term care that pops up then that ends up being a million dollars for 10 years or five years in a facility, right? Somebody who ends up with a million dollars of healthcare costs. Like, because those are almost the ones, right, where you're saying, you know, if you kind of live an average life and you spend an average amount and you have social security, yeah, you might not live the most extravagant retirement, but you kind of get by. And Americans have been fairly resilient on getting by, right? Yeah. Changing your lifestyle. But there is that group that I worry about, right? That those really kind of negative outcomes occur. Yeah. And then they end up with really probably a, a 10 years of their life that are not really optimal. Yeah. Right? So presenting it as a number that you need to have accumulated at retirement is um, is a bit um, misleading because mm-hmm. you're not necessarily you don't necessarily need that pot of money at retirement. You're largely funding it through cash flow, um, whether it's you know Social Security or personal assets, throwing off income. So you don't need that set aside. A better way to look at it would be what would be my annual expenses, and others have done research that looked at what your annual expenses will be and how would you manage them. So for instance, I've seen re- research that suggests your uh, expected costs can be managed through. Uh, customary sources of income, social security, mm-hmm. RMDs, et cetera, et cetera. And then your non, your unexpected costs would have to be managed through other assets perhaps. Um, but you're really worried about the 5% of the, 95% of the time you may not face these um, extraordinary healthcare expenses, which is what really people are worried about, right? It's not necessarily I'm going to have healthcare expenses, right? We, we, we know for a fact that they run on average from 5 to 15%, depending on which age group you're in as a percentage of your expenditures. What you're really worried about is that 5% of the time that there may be an extraordinary healthcare shock that puts you in a long-term care facility, nurse, skilled nursing facility, where you're now spending hundreds of thousands of dollars per year for X number of years. And, and for that, I think advisors would just have to say, what are the tools I have to manage that long tail risk? We created the risk management chart that looks at your mm-hmm. exposure, the probability of something happening, the probability of negative consequences, and how, what's the risk management uh, technique for that risk. And I think if you're an advisor and you're looking at healthcare risk and say, well, we can retain that risk because you're super affluent, or we have to pool that risk because um, you have some assets, but maybe not enough to cover the 5% of the time that you could mm-hmm. face that, right? I mean, that's the big thing. You could, an advisor could say, look, 95 percent of the time you're fine but there's a five percent chance that you'll have extraordinary expenses late in life in healthcare. and to which i would say well how do i know if i'm in the 95 or five it's impossible to tell so i still need to ensure possibly ensure that risk but if you're an advisor and you say well we've we 
it, we cut check, got that risk, and, we're, and here's how we're going to mitigate it. Then you've at least given what you describe it as sleep at night a second ago, yeah, a little bit ago. I want to be able to help anxiety. my clients sleep at night and say, and to me, this is more the more interesting thing I think about retirement is when you were saving for retirement, there are a couple of risks you have to worry about, right? Inflation, yeah. market volatility, blah, blah, blah. In retirement, I think there's a gabillion risk that you have mm -hmm. to think about. And for me, the best thing an advisor could do is to have a risk chart that says we covered longevity, we covered inflation, we covered market volatility, we covered death of a spouse, divorce, bad advice, blah, 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 all the way down the list. And, and here, Mr. Uh, client, uh, you can sleep at night. We've got all these risks managed and mitigated in some form or fashion. It also comes up to me that, uh, you know, from an advisor perspective, these are the people you can actually add the most value for, right? So you think of your very, very overfunded clients. They're very wealthy and uh, maybe the impact of uh, a tail risk like that is not going to be as substantial. Then you've got some very, very underfunded clients where it's going to make that much of a difference anyway. There's not much you can do from yeah. an advisor perspective, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But it's that, it's that segment in Middle. between where they're maybe on the you know on the cusp they're you know they're uh, either go one way or the other and if you come up with a solution that actually solves that tail risk you've actually added an extreme amount of value to their financial plan yeah and if you think about you, know, you talked about the number one concerns another another big concern is this notion of i don't want to be a burden on my children mm -hmm. and so if you as an advisor can say we're going to remove that feeling that you have of being a burden on your children well that's a big win right now again they can sleep at night because i don't have to worry about this 5% tail risk that's out there. Well, for Mr. Retirement himself, right, Mr. Bob Powell, what does your, you know, financially free retirement look like for yourself? <sighs> yeah. Deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think it's, uh, you know, it probably goes down that path of service. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if I, so part of me thinks uh, there's no need for me to ever stop writing about retirement as long as I find enjoyment in doing it and feel that I'm helping people. So I think I look at a phased retirement for myself where maybe I don't write as much and I scale back and I write for fewer entities. Um, the other is a service to community. Um, I'm very involved in my local town and, in um, uh, various groups. I'm involved at, in, for instance, in, um, there's a uh, an age-friendly effort going around the world. The World Health Organization, mm -hmm. ARP here in the United States, are trying to make communities more age-friendly. So I'm the co-chair of my town's age-friendly effort. And I'm also the uh, on the board of our town's retirement um, fund. So I think this importance of, you know, giving back to others is, is an important part. And I think then, you know, there's also the personal enjoyment. So I'd say being able to keep riding my bike and playing hockey is an integral part of what my best retirement looks like, and then a little travel along the way to places I've never had the chance to go to. And I'll, I'll kind of add a little bit to, to that question, and then we'll wrap up, I think, with Devin, which is because uh, everyone's kind of told us this, or not everybody, but a lot of people have added like what their income plan kind of looks like. So I don't know if you have a fully fledged out retirement income plan, but are there themes that you really want in your own retirement income? Yeah. So I, I, I go, I, I, you know, one of the early themes that I gravitated toward way back when was something that Farrell Dolan developed, which was called the four box strategy, right? And it's so easy and simple to implement, which is uh, match your, um, your guaranteed sources of income against your essential expenses and match your, your risky assets against your discretionary, right? Floor and upside, essentially. So I think that is, is it in a nutshell is to say, do I have enough guaranteed sources of income that will last uh, on an, and perhaps on an inflation adjusted basis, yeah. to quote Zvi, <laughs> uh, to, to match that, that lifespan and to make sure that if I'm in my case, my wife is five years younger, and and if history is, you know, is some is sort of relevant here, I will predecease her by five years, and so uh, there will be a ten year period where you know she'll have to be on her own. So I want to make sure that the surviving spouse, in my case, my wife, has enough to live on for the rest of her life. Yeah, I, I loved your version of, of of your retirement, especially you know the community and the, the town of Swampscott is lucky to have you. Absolutely, <laughs> some may not think so. <laughs> What do you want your professional legacy to be and look like? What do you want people to remember your work as? Yeah, I, I think it goes back to the starfish story that, that I helped someone. We just did a webinar the other day called Women Divorced in Retirement, and it was inspired by a financial planner who called me to say there's a problem out there. Women don't have the education that they need when they're going through a divorce to get a financially equitable settlement. So we decided to do a series of webinars on women divorced in retirement. And in the comment field during the live webinar, a woman wrote and said, um, 
I got divorced 10 years ago. I wish I knew then what I know now. And um, like, that's it, right? That you want to be there to help someone at the right time. I, I can tell you're super passionate about it. And like I said, I've known you for years. I know you're as passionate as, it, as, as I can see you being passionate today. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a great answer. Now, it's, uh, this is a wonderful conversation. And, you know, I, I hope that this conversation leads to more than one starfish going back into the ocean. And, uh, you know, I know that the, the listeners, myself, Devin, everybody really appreciates all your work. And, you know, I want to thank you for spending time with us here today because I, I know that you always have a lot on your plate at any given time. And, uh, yeah, it was just great conversation here. Thank you, Jamie. I'm grateful for the chance to chat about the topic I <laughs> love talking about. Yeah. And then I want to thank everybody else for listening to this episode of the Framework Podcast. <laughs>